Again, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the CTSC uh, webinar for January 23rd, 2016. I'm your host, Jeanette Dopheide. Today's topic is the Open Science Cyber Risk Profile. This is a group presentation this morning. Uh, today we have Richard Leduc, uh, Director of Computational Proto Prote Proteomics at the Proteomics Center of Excellence, uh, Dr. Shine Pice. Sean Peisert, Chief Scientist for Cybersecurity for CENIC and a Staff Scientist at Berkeley Lab. Vaughn Welch, Director of Indiana University's Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research. And Dr. Karen Stocks, the Director of Geological Data Center uh, at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. CTSC is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high-quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about CTSC can be found at trustedci.org. Before we begin, I have a few items to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box in the Adobe Connect window, which you may have already seen here. We will accept questions after the, at the end of the presentation as well. And with that, I will hand the microphone over to Dr. Karen Stocks. Welcome, Karen. You're still on mute. Thank you very you... much. I, I think I'm off now. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Great. All right, <laughs> so my name is Karen Stox, um, and I'm here because I am one of the intended audiences of the Open Science Cyber Risk Profile that we're going to be presenting today. Um, it's a little bit of a mouthful, so I'll probably just refer to it as the Risk Profile. <laughs> so as, as a domain scientist, I'm an oceanographer. Um, I do manage a data center, and I lead projects that create online data and code resources. But I have no formal computer science training or IT training, and certainly no um, cybersecurity training. So I really got started in this field with the perspective that if it's open data, if it's open resources, there's really nothing to worry about from a cybersecurity perspective. Um, sure, you need to be, you know, be careful with your passwords and, and patch your systems. Um, but beyond that, there wasn't much <clears throat> that I needed to think about. Um, and I think I'm not atypical in, in that perspective. Um, but it is true that bad things do happen. And we'll talk a little bit more later about the kinds of bad things that happen. But even in open systems, um, where the data are open, um, cybersecurity attacks can be a serious problem. In my case, um, I had a distributed denial of service attack that took my system out for about a week uh, a couple of years ago. Um, we got it back up, but that was a week in which my community couldn't get their work done, uh, and that was a problem. It's also a problem if um, your entire system is hijacked and uh, ransom back to you for money. Um, it's a problem if you have sensors that are hooked up um, and somebody malicious gets in and starts to do bad things with them. It's a problem if the integrity of my scientific data, even though it's open, if the integrity of that data is compromised. So there's a whole suite of um, concerns even around open data systems. So for me, the risk profile provides a, a foundation or a framework for me to think about the cybersecurity of my systems. Uh, again, having no security training, I didn't even really know where to start with this. Um, but as you'll see later, the risk profile sort of walks me through um, what my scientific assets are that I care about, what the concerns regarding those assets are, what the severity of the consequences are, and that gives me a foundation to begin to talk with my IT people about developing a security plan. <clears throat> so the overall motivation for the, this group in creating the risk profile was to help support 
the trustworthy nature of scientific computing by better understanding the risks uh, that are posed to even open science and cyber attacks. And as I mentioned before, even if it's open data, uh, there are certainly many risks that still exist. Um, we're working to go beyond a discussion of the technological risks from an IT perspective and to carry that through to understand how those risks translate to consequences to the science that those computing resources support. Um, so again, the overall goal is to understand how the IT risks relate to the risks of the scientific mission and the open science projects. So it brings it back not from not just in, in technology speak, but it brings it back to talking about things that I understand and care about, like the accessibility of my data and systems, the integrity of my data, things like that. <clears throat> and as I mentioned before, uh, quite a lot of bad things can happen to good science, even good open science. Um, there are untargeted attacks. Um, from those that really don't know or care what the particular uh, science mission of that resource is. Uh, there are stepping stone attacks where your system is simply being used to attack other systems. Ransomware happens where your, your, your data and your infrastructure is stolen um, and offered back to you for a price. Uh, anything that has an IP address these days is vulnerable to you know, a variety of worms and viruses that are out there. Um, but there's also targeted attacks. Um, hacktivism, or hacktivism, I'm not sure the, the correct term there, um, happens, I know, for example, that climate change um, science resources have been hacked by those who uh, are not supportive of the climate change research. Um, an astronomical observatory, I believe, has been in the past and you can imagine going into the future that um, things like stem cell research and other areas are particularly sensitive. Um, similarly, political, um, they, things can be targeted for political reasons and simply for scientific competition. This, this does exist, unfortunately. <clears throat> so the risk profile it came about now because there really is an increasing, not just a number, of cyber threats out there, um, but increasing sophistication in them. It's not just mission impossible anymore, where you've got really organized, large-scale cyber criminal organizations. You have state-sponsored hacking. And this has resulted in some really big uh, breaches. So Stuxnet um, impacted the Iranian nuclear program. That's pretty scary. Um, Office of Personnel Management lost data from for 20, something like 20 million people. Some of that information um, was supporting clearance, security clearances, so it was pretty deep and pretty personal. Um, last year, the Yahoo breach of 100, uh, excuse me, of 1 billion users. Um, so they're big, they're serious, they're organized. Uh, these examples are not from open science projects, but it's pretty plausible to see that open science may increasingly also be a target for these kinds of attacks, particularly as I, as I mentioned, there are politically sensitive kinds of research being done um, <clears throat> and some pretty serious uh, privacy concerns around uh, genetic genomic data, um, urban data, things like that. So that gives a background for the motivation of the risk profile from a scientist's perspective. Um, I'm going to hand off now <coughs> Rich, are you ready yep, to take thank over? You. Mm -hmm. Great. So uh, this is Rich LeDuc, and I'm going to present a couple of use cases. There happen to be two projects that I'm involved with. And to give you an idea of what we're talking about when we're talking about open science, these are not the largest use cases nor the smallest. They're sort of just some median use cases. So the first is the consortium for top-down proteomics. The consortium, uh, we're doing something called proteomics, and we're doing a particular flavor of that that's called top-down. And so the consortium is a group of 200 research labs across the world that are all doing researching or using this uh, 
this methodology, this top-down proteomics. We're all using very high-end mass spectrometers, primarily FTICR instruments and uh, the new Orbitrap. And we're trying to identify and characterize intact proteins in biological mixtures. And so the consortium does have a web presence. We have uh, this little cartoon of our, uh, our site. We have this proteiform repository whereas where con when consortium members discover new proteiforms, whatever those are, they can upload them into this repository. This repository is then available to the world. The data, the mass spec data that supports the proteiforms are archived. We're providing a, uh, a uh, archive capabilities with IU, with Indiana University ScholarWorks, but then other, some researchers use their own archives, but we link out to that. So this is one, uh, one facility. It's currently hosted on virtual machines that are provided by Northwest. Uh, Northwestern University. And then the other project is the National Resource for Translational and Developmental Proteomics. And this is an NF NIH funded project that has a, we provide a national scale resource. So this is a resource to, uh, to researchers within the U.S that want to do proteomics, we do tend to do primarily top-down. We have two satellite centers, one of which is the Magnet Lab in Florida, which is a large NSF-funded uh, facility, and they have a nice 21 Tesla research instrument down there. And then uh, there's another satellite center in Austin, Texas, and then we have other groups scattered around. I woke up this morning with a call from Rich, what are we going to do about Mayo Clinic, and they're looking for some data. So we're, you know, large distributed group, and we have a little slide of our back end. One of the things that the NRTDP does that's a little more interesting from a uh, from an infrastructure IT infrastructure is we provide a computational resource that's exposed to the world. So we have. <clears throat> Again, virtual machine up at Northwestern. It's got a Galaxy web portal front end. Galaxy is an open source bioinformatics tool. And then that portal can control jobs. Uh, that portal can control jobs on the NU research technology cluster. Uh, so we've got, you know, we have a dedicated node. We have a uh, some spillover SUs, and that sort of material. And I think with that, I am going to pass off to Sean, who will go actually into the risk profile document. Thanks so much, Rich. So uh, <clears throat> I'd like to describe a few of the challenges to uh, achieving the goal of the Open Science Cyber Risk Profile. Actually, just to, to, to recap a couple of things, one of the things that I'd like to describe as the challenge to putting together this whole effort, much uh, in the same way as Karen described some of her early impressions of what security looked like, I think that, that that's actually a general reflection of the way typically scientists might think about their work. One of the things they might view it as is an impediment to getting science done. Oh, I've got to do all of these other things. A number of other things that, that might come up are the question of why would anyone target me? or why would I have anything that, that's worth manipulating or stealing? And, and uh, I think uh, it was through the, the uh, process of putting together this document that we really tried to help uh, the, the, the cybersecurity professionals and the scientists tried to work together to come up with under, ways to, to describe that in a way that made sense to both sides. The, the cybersecurity professionals really understood the, the ethos and vocabulary of the, uh, of the domain scientists, and the domain scientists understood some of the, issue, some of the uh, concerns that the cybersecurity professionals had. And that was actually, that's, that, that's very much um, uh, one of the, uh, it looks like the third bullet on this slide is cut off. I apologize for that. But that was very much one of the key challenges of this document was working ex extremely 
cross domain cross you know the, the in terms of uh, uh, the way that uh, uh, these two groups tend to think about what their priorities are and um, so that that was an important part of the discussion and one that v took a, quite a long time in fact to try and get past as we tried to understand where each other came from and where we uh, uh, where we, how we could describe things so that each other understood it, it, the important facets of, of the, the multiple domains in addition to that, there are the simple challenges of the environments in which we work in. Um, I think uh, if uh, we were doing cybersecurity in many commercial IT environments, we might uh, simply describe assets uh, or computing assets in terms of uh, a Linux system over there and a MySQL database over there and an Oracle database over there. Uh, in contrast, the sorts of environments that we work in in open science are quite a lot different, um, and the attributes are, are of those environments are quite a lot different. One of the, the distinctions between those uh, environments is the nature of the equipment itself. Um, and as Vaughn will get into, I think, when he, he enumerates the assets a little bit later, we have everything from refrigerators uh, containing samples of, of biological materials that might be remote controlled by Internet of Things devices to radio telescopes that sit on the top of the mountain that could be remote control rotated around uh, to light sources and particle accelerators and, and so on and so forth or, or heating and cooling equipment inside computing environments. And so there, there are a lot of rather exotic pieces of, of scientific instruments. In addition to the scientific instruments themselves, the computing uh, environments are also somewhat different as well. On the surface, one might look at a high-performance computing machine and say, oh, that's just another a big Linux box with some high-speed interconnects and fast disks put together in, in a special purpose room. The reality is that there's a lot of very custom components with inside those, those systems and a lot of very custom software uh, written by, uh, uh, in, in some cases, vendors for custom hardware and in some cases, domain scientists literally over decades who have written different types of application software to do, spe do specific things. And again, circling back to uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the scientific, uh, inter the controlled scientific assets as well, one of the things that comes out is that there are a lot of restrictions on the way that these devices can be updated as well, much in the same way as if you've ever worked inside, say, a medical environment of some kind. The operating systems that run these systems are often quite old, often quite unpatchable, um, and, and this is by design. You, you have a, a, a piece of scientific equipment that's designed to last for 20 or 30 years, and messing with the computing environment in a way that might uh, cause some sort of long-term disruption to the use of an extremely expensive asset is, uh, is something that most scientists would, wouldn't even dream of, of, uh, into, of messing with at all. Uh, there is the traditional approach of simply trying to firewall off those systems, but that carries risks as well. Hence, these challenges of trying to un identify what those risks are to begin with. Um, and so th those, were, um, those were things that uh, Vaughn and I and the rest of the organizers and members of the working group, including Karen and Rich, spent uh, several months trying to understand a bit better in terms of what exactly those environments look like um, in, uh, in great detail. The last facet of this, much in the, is, as well, is that uh, is the goal of, of cybersecurity in many of these environments as well. Although there are confidentiality risks in many cases, and um, I think Karen highlighted uh, a few of those up, up front in terms of the idea that there could be some sort of personally identifying information, perhaps personal health information in some of these, these uh, pieces of information. There can also be um, situations in which there is valuable intellectual property. Um, there, are, there can also be situations um, in which there is simply data that's embargoed uh, for a period of time. If one thinks about the, uh, in the experiments that take places in environments like um, astronomy, like uh, with some of the, the more, more powerful radio telescopes in the world, like the LIGO experiments uh, last year that were examining gravitational waves, there's often a period of months and perhaps years of data gathering in which the raw data itself is not released, or perhaps even conclusions on the data until, there's, until some period of time passes or there's a consensus that the data should be released. As such, the data itself is not necessarily permanently uh, confidential, it's simply embargoed for a period of time uh, be uh, before the, the scientists determine it's okay to release it. 
Uh, as such, that's, there's a key distinction in terms of the confidentiality properties of data relating to open science that's quite different than the data in, in many sorts of commercial environments. On, in contrast, integrity very often reigns supreme here. The, the idea is that if we are doing some sort of scientific experiment that is uh, for, for which some sort of phenomenon uh, occurs frequently or is detected infrequently, it's extremely important that uh, that we capture that, exper that the results of the, the experiment the first time around and, uh, and don't accidentally miss that. If there's uh, a, a radio telescope pointing up into the sky and a new supernova appears uh, in the field of view, we want that to capture the super supernova as, as it is appearing uh, as it begins to appear, not after it's been start to, started to appear several minutes or hours later, perhaps. Um, and uh, and like, like, likewise as well, there's an emphasis on open, distributed, and collaborative compu uh, communities as well that is also quite distinct from many commercial environments as well. If you think about many of the computing environments, uh, or particularly the high-performance computing environments that exist in the world, you can imagine the, the uh, difficulty and challenge that might be associated with maintaining auth uh, with authentication in such environments, for example. How do you distribute 5,000 multi-factor authentication tokens to users around the world who you've never seen before? How do you, f how do you work out uh, a situation in which you can have multiple kinds of Nobel Prize winning science occurring on the same high performance computing facility and not have potential scientific competitors interfering with each other's work in some fashion? Uh, the, 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 the sorts of, kind of, of issues uh, like this go on and on, in fact, as well. And of course, uh, uh, if one looks at medical environments, again, just to use that example, um, in, in my own environment uh, within the University of California, there's been a recent initiative in which we, we are connecting all of our different uh, uh, electronic health records. Uh, one of the challenges uh, in, this, in such an environment is uh, that there tends to be a great deal of proprietariness about one's information. And in, in, in addition, even if one is running the same electronic health record system, there tends to be a great deal of concern about um, uh, whether the systems are, in fact, even if they're the same, are, are interoperable due to configuration differences. And so it, it's, it's this very open in principle, uh, but uh, very um, uh, very closed in, in other ways sorts of environments where one is when one sort of recognizes that one has international collaborators and yet one tends to as a scientist not necessarily have the perspective that the entire internet is, is a, able to reach their systems and so those are all challenges to meeting the goals of the open science cyber risk profile that we sought to work through the approach that we uh, we sought to take in this environment was to essentially try to start to enumer enumerate all of the different types of common scientific assets and the information technology risks that were associated with each of them. A scientific asset was something that we defined as a resource that was critical to the science mission. And again, we're focusing primarily on uh, on, on IT assets themselves, but not every one of these IT assets is necessarily something that's plugged into a network. It could simply be something that affects the, the device that's plugged into a network. So, for example, the one IT person who knows all of the passwords to the systems is, in fact, in, in some, some fashion, a scientific asset, because if something happens to that person, the, scientific, the mission of the scientific uh, uh, system that's ongoing might be in significant trouble. Our list of scientific asset is not scientific assets is not necessarily an exhaustive list. We're hoping that over time that others will add to this list as new types of scientific assets are developed, or others consider existing or additional types of scientific assets that we did not consider to be perhaps more important going forward. What we simply sought to do was take some of the most important ones that we, we understood using some of the case studies that we went through in our environment, such as the proteogenomics that was discussed earlier, such as the astronomical uh, example that we just mentioned, such as a case with um, uh, particle accelerators as well was another example, and a number of other case studies that we went through as we tried to flesh out our understanding of the key challenges in open science. Our hope uh, it, with this document is that scientists will be able to sit down, understand some of their key assets that, that are under their, their control or relate to the scientific work that they are doing in their environments, 
be able to understand what some of the risks are and be able to have an intelligent conversation with an information technology or information security professional to be able to discuss the importance of those assets, the importance, uh, uh, the, the risks to the scientific mission, should, should some of these uh, risks actually turn into uh, actual failures, um, and to have an understanding of the consequences to the scientific mission of whatever the scientists and their colleagues are doing should something go wrong. In other words, it's designed in some ways to be a bit of a dictionary or a translation guide between the language that an information security professional understands and the language that scientists uh, might understand. In general, we tried to err on the side of making this a document that the scientist would understand because we felt it was the most important thing to be able to get a scientist to actually pick this up and want to be able to read it and want to be able to have a conversation. As a result, information technology professionals might see slightly different words than they're, they're accustomed to seeing in this document um, that they might use among uh, the, their own uh, colleagues in some environments. But again, this is, this is designed to make to, uh, in, in more to help scientists be more conversant on their own. Our approach for this in this document was to focus on an asset-centric and a consequence-based document. We are not trying to enumerate all possible actors who might perpetrate some sort of threat of some kind. Rather, we wanted to start with what systems are, 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 are ones that a scientist can identify are important to the science they're conducting. And the, pure, the, the reason for this is that we felt it is a, a much more easy thing to be able to understand the assets uh, for a scientist to be able to identify and understand the assets that are under their control than it is for a scientist or an IT professional to try and understand or guess the types of, of, of actors or, or untargeted malware or other things that might be out there on the internet potentially targeting those assets. Therefore, um, uh, this is why, one of the reasons why we're start starting again with the, this asset-centric view of things. And the reason we are understanding a consequence-based view of things as well is that in addition to understanding the asset, we wanted to essentially understand if something goes wrong, what is the consequence of that to science? In other words, uh, if this freezer goes, goes, uh, goes down and it's down for a period of time, the biological samples that are contained in that will become unusable. Or if this radio telescope turns to another portion of the sky, we will miss this supernova taking place. Or if these detectors are taken offline in this particle accelerator, we might miss the collisions that are taking place, and it will be another six months before we can reproduce the same kind of environment. Those are the sort of sorts of consequences that we took, we tried to, to focus on. In contrast, we rarely, uh, if ever, even discussed the idea that it might be a mal, uh, some piece of malware, as opposed to an insider threat of some kind. Th th those distinctions were dramatically less important for putting together this document. That doesn't mean they aren't put important for putting together mitigations. But again, this document isn't focused on mitigations. It's, under, it's focused on understanding the risks to science. <clears throat> um, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, the, the OSR uh, CRP working group. Um, uh, Michael uh, Dopheide uh, also goes by Dop and I uh, from ESNet, which is at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Von Welsh, Andrew Adams, and Susan Sons from the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence at Indiana University. Uh, uh, in general, were the organizers of the working group. Uh, Ruth Ann Bevier at Caltech, Rich Leduc from Northwestern, Pascal Meunier from Purdue and Hub Zero, Stephen Schwab from the USC Information Sciences Institute, and Karen Stocks from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego, all served as core members of this working group. Additional contributing members uh, were Ilka Atlantis from the San Diego Supercomputer Center at UC San Diego, James Cuff from Harvard, Regan Moore from IRODS at, uh, uh, in North Carolina, and Warren Raquel from NCSA uh, all served as contributing members as well. The OSRCP uh, document itself is, a, uh, is, is essentially an introduction to the problem and uh, uh, much a, a statement of uh, essentially uh, in, in much the way that Karen worked th uh, started things off today, discussing the idea that bad things can happen to good science. It then essentially walk, works uh, its way down to a list of common scientific assets. Each of those science assets is linked to a diagram that shows science concerns, consequences of something that could, uh, could take place, and at least potential avenues of attack. 
Uh, as you can see on the left uh, here, um, it's, uh, if, uh, if you expand your, your screen to be large enough to be able to see this, um, you can see this, uh, this list of, of consequences from uh, uh, top to bottom. Uh, essentially, uh, if, uh, uh, again, because we were focusing on the bad thing that could happen to the science, um, there, there might be some sort of uh, consequence, um, uh, or there, there might be some sort of concern in which there be, might be a device that was uh, inaccessible. It might have been due to some sort of uh, equipment uh, uh, that was uh, malfunctioning, or equipment that was damaged, or a misconfiguration, or a denial of service attack, or an unauthorized user. And these are a, a number of things that we tried to enumerate to a certain extent, but are not exhaustive. But certainly, at, at the end of the day, um, the idea that uh, should the device not be performing as, as expected, um, or uh, the device might be inaccessible of some kind, that uh, there might be a variety of different consequences to that. Now, th this particular asset that we're focusing on as servers, we, we didn't dive as deep, as, as deep into consequence because it, it depends a bit on exactly the type of the data type. But if you can see on the right, we listed numerous different types of data, and there, there are different concerns and con consequences for each one of those data types, depending on what it is. Is it purely public data? Is it embargoed data, uh, which is going to be released after a period of time? Is it internal data, uh, which is to say that it's data that's never intended to be released, um, either because it, it's simply not documented well enough, or, or it's really main, intended to be made private, or, or whatever it happens to be? Is it documentation of some kind? Uh, so it's it's not actually configuration or, or data. It simply describes how a system is supposed to be work supposed to work or how data is supposed to be interpreted, and and so on. Again, we also uh, included facility assets, and I think facility assets were something that were that might be commonly overlooked both by cybersecurity professionals as well as by scientists, but they are certainly extremely important parts of many scientific missions. Likewise, there are a huge number of system and hardware assets. On the surface, it might seem simply that we might have some sort of web portal in, in the front end, a database in the back end, and an operating system. The reality is that there are numerous kinds of system, hardware, and software assets, each having their own distinctive cybersecurity uh, risks that are associated with them and potential mitigations um, that might go along with, uh, with, with securing those assets. And so we felt it uh, quite important to identify all of those separately. Again, the most important part of these these assets uh, that we felt was to was two things. First, to help identify scientists to begin with, that each one of these things and potentially more that we didn't list that might be added to this list in the future by others are important things that they need to think about and consider. And second, to understand uh, uh, the the different sorts of concerns until in terms of the things that could go wrong with those assets and the consequences if if something did happen to those assets as well. How should one use the OSR RCP? <clears throat> in general, I, I think uh, I, I, I've alluded to this a little bit in, in, uh, in the prior slide, but just to walk through in, a, in detail, the most important thing is for somebody, for one of the scientists to try and identify all of the different stakeholders associated with a science project of some kind. These could be the scientists that have set up the science project, in addition to a variety of the, the people who might be using the, the scientific assets from outside. Um, they could be other people from within the university or the institution who are responsible for maintaining some of the scientific assets, potentially the facilities, for example, that are not in direct control of the scientists. Uh, they include faculty, they include staff, they include graduate students or postdocs, uh, and so on. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> it's important that those stakeholders work together to create an inventory of their own important assets. They might use the OSRC, uh, OSCRP document as a starting point to understand what sorts of classes of assets to begin with and then move on to try and fit their assets into those different categories. They might even find some assets that don't fit into those categories, and that's fine. The important thing is that they're actually working together and having a discussion about what the important assets are to their scientific mission. For each one of those assets, they need to examine what sorts of things could go wrong with those assets. Could there be a hardware failure? Could there be manipulation of those devices? Could there be a weather-related failure? Could there be a communications outage? Could there be a power outage? For each one of those things, if should one of those things take place, what are the consequences to the science mission that's going on as well? And in addition, perhaps starting to, to understand by looking at the, the broad classes of, of assets that we've described, the different ways in which those failures might actually take place to begin with. 
for each one of those things, uh, the, the assets that they've described, for, for wherever there is a consequence to the science mission that they feel is an, is an important one enough that needs to be mitigated of some kind, it's important at that point for the scientists and a number of the stakeholders to be able to work with IT, IT professionals to discuss, understand, and agree on and implement agreed controls to protect the, those consequences from taking place to mitigate the risk. We should add that, that, that uh, again, understanding the specific threats and ac actually implementing controls are out of scope for the OSR or CRP. But uh, actually, again, having the conversation is vi a vital portion of our goals. So just to give uh, a specific example, consider some uh, embargo data, much in the same way as I described earlier, should an, an oceanographic expedition go out for a six-month period of time, and there might be another 18-month period for which the scientists would have a chance to, to, discuss, to examine the data before it might be publicly released. One might identify the stakeholders by starting with the immediate, immediate project team and a, perhaps a collaborating research team and the institutions that, uh, that house uh, the, those, those scientific assets. Oh, I guess we used uh, telescopes in this example, uh, so we'll use that one here. Um, they might uh, review the OSCRP asset catalog and say, ah, here's some data that, that actually shouldn't be released for a period of time. It's embargoed data. That's important due to both the funding sources and the collaborators involved. And so it's important that we have uh, some sort of mechanism both to keep that data safe from being altered as well as safe from being exposed for some sort of period of time. It's important for them to understand that uh, where that embargoed data is and how it's collected. There's computing machines that are maintained by staff. There's networking uh, equipment that facilitates that. There's laptops and workstations that, collect, that connect to those systems. There's the telescopes themselves that actually collect the data that's stored in, in, uh, on those computing systems. And of course, there's the file store uh, that might contain both preliminary results before they're pushed down to computers as well. So there, again, there, there might be at least four and perhaps more different kinds of cyber-connected assets that are, that are relevant to the scientific mission that are all extremely important for a scientist to understand, to be able to have a conversation with, about, uh, with, with an IT professional about. And clearly having <clears throat> some sort of downtime for the telescope, having some sort of, uh, of, of data that might be manipulated and lost given that, again, phenomena might not occur again ever if, if, or, or, or soon, are extremely important ways for a scientist to begin to have that conversation with an IT professional. Let's see. Um, I think uh, at this point, uh, uh, Vaughn, I was actually going to hand it on to you, although uh, perhaps you might want to continue on this, uh, this uh, existing slide. Well, actually, uh, before we do that, can I just pop in with this question here? Earlier in the previous slide, I think it was, Nick Lewis says, Something you might want to add is for biological samples that are dangerous and needs to keep frozen. If the freezer temp is increased, the sample could become dangerous, i.e. if the freezer temp can be controlled via IP connection, it might be an IT security risk. Per perfect example. Um, and um, I'm not sure if that's one that we considered or, or not, actually. Um, um, it might have been, but it's a perfect example. It would be kind of a, would be kind of a rare case. Mostly, if they've got a pathogen, I think you usually keep it alive and going. So you have different containment facilities than a freezer. Most of the things in a freezer, the risk is that they warm up and are destroyed. But yeah, we could there could be frozen pathogens that you would prefer to keep cold. Uh, that does occur, could occur. Okay, Vaughn, uh, I'll hand it off to you at this point. Vaughn, you might still be muted. Or if not, I can keep going. <laughs> Okay, I'll keep going. Um, I think uh, Vaughn might be indisposed for a moment uh, with, uh, with audio problems. <laughs> All right, uh, Vaughn, please jump in when, when, uh, if you get back online. So again, for, for each uh, asset, looking up the relevant diagram in the Open Science Cyber Risk Profile, um, you can see right here with the, the case of the Embargo Data Scientific Asset, uh, the, again, the concerns might be um, inaccessible or lost data. 
um, corrupted data that might then lead to inaccessible or lost data, or exposed data. All of these things relate, to, uh, as cybersecurity professionals might describe, both to confidentiality, um, potentially availability, as well as integrity. Although, we very much, uh, again, for the scientists on, on, on this call, or for the scientists that are using these documents, try to avoid using kind of these reserved words that really came out of a Department of Defense context for understanding science, um, uh, which are, are um, somewhat different to here in, in these kinds of environments and not necessarily meaningful in the same way to domain scientists. Um, from all of these concerns that might uh, take place within data, uh, there are a variety of different sorts of consequences that might result. Uh, this might include um, uh, if there were an, uh, were data were, were some sort of scientific data that were lost or corrupted uh, or inaccessible that were repro reproducible, one might simply have to take the time to reproduce it, um, and uh, and that simply might be very costly, and it could range from. Uh, rerunning an experiment overnight to recalibrating an experiment over weeks or months uh, uh, of some kind. There might be some sort of experiment that, that simply may not be reproducible. Again, it's some sort of phenomena that that uh, um, that simply isn't going to take place again in the same way uh, in the future, and so therefore it's simply a phenomena that we are not going to understand any time in the near future. There might be incorrect science results, which uh, which are also extremely important to understand as well. One of the important things for, for science is understanding all of the different variables uh, is, as one is setting up an experiment that, so that one can try and reduce, ideally, to a single variable as one is, is running experiments and has controls around all of the other sorts of uh, uh, knobs that one might turn in, an, in a different in, uh, environment of some kind. On the other hand, if uh, the computing environment is being manipulated out from under them, that's another variable that they wouldn't be able to necessarily control or, under, or understand. As a result, um, uh, an incorrect science results is, is yet another consequence of corrupted data that we felt was extremely important to indicate to scientists as well so they could have that conversation with IT professionals too. Reputation uh, could be as important uh, as, as incorrect results. Uh, it, th this is something that I'm not sure all of us considered when we began this, this process, but uh, it is the case that very often scientists simply get one shot to, expo to describe their results in, in some sort of way that might be uh, uh, understood in, um, and, and gain popularity or, or gain some sort of public knowledge or attention. Um, if those results are incorrect the first time around, will they uh, uh, cause some sort of embarrassment to the scientist that might make the results less likely to be understood or accepted in the future? Oh, Vaughn, I think you're back on. Would you like to con continue with this slide? Yeah, hi, Sean. Can folks hear me now? Yes, you're on. Okay, good. Thank you. All right, well, thank you, Sean. I think you've done a, you've pretty much covered this slide here and the, the one perspective that I will just add before you know moving on is if you just look quickly at the, the diagram here and if you think of this as a bridge, you kind of have the, the scientist side of things, the consequences on the top, and then as you move down from those consequences, you end up with the more IT uh, infosec-centric on the avenue. So one can think of this as a map starting from the scientist perspective and moving down uh, to what's in critical for doing the, the mitigations. And actually, as part of this, with sitting with the stakeholders and starting at the top, the consequences side, so as you're sitting down with the stakeholders, the PIs, the scientists, or whatever, is having that conversation then at this point with which of the consequences at the top are most important. And so this can be a case of walking through them and figuring out, you know, corrupted data may be really critical. You may find some things that in the context of a particular project are not so important, and you can actually then sort of remove those uh, from the diagram, and so you may find that concerns then even drop off your list if you remove all the consequences of, of particular importance. Or you may find consequences that uh, our document hasn't thought of, right? So you think about you know something like that Nick brought up, you may be something that you can add to it. You know, these are meant to be fairly generic, and so they're, they're, they're starting points. And so then, as you know, we get down for this particular example, we've crossed off uh, the fact that you know it's impossible to uh, to reproduce data. So consequences, some of these consequences get down, and then data exposure here gets uh, gets added as 
as an example as we move move through. And so now by having this mapping down, you can look at the avenue attack. So one comment to add here is as you look at the avenue of attack, you can see a, a set of um, some of the, the avenues of attack may suggest new assets that you want to go look about. So from the scientist perspective, they may not see the importance of a server, per, for example. But as you look and you see how the, the consequences flow down uh, from a particular, through a concern, you can see how the server, for example, fit in with the scientific asset. So it's not a scientific asset, per se, from the scientist's perspective, but now you see that. So you may add assets as you go through this process, and hence add, bring in other parts of the risk profile into the equation. So this is just drilling down uh, on one of the particular assets that was drilled down, and it may add additional assets to the list. So then the next step, hey, step I'm five. Sorry, Vaughn. Uh, Vaughn, can yeah. I just pop in for a second? Uh, we have a question here. Can you talk about the priorities from an adversary perspective? Yeah, a little bit. So I see this is a question from Vince. And you know, Vince, we, from the perspective of uh, as Sean talked about, we were really taking an, an, ass, an asset-centric point of view on this. So we were really looking at the priorities from the scientists' uh, point of view and what they were doing. And we didn't touch so much upon what a particular um, threat actor or an adversary may look at in a given situation, uh, in part because we think that those are going to change and they're also hard to be predictable. So what we really looked at here is trying to figure out what the consequences would be to a scientist. And that would cover some, um, some prioritization from, from adversaries if it's uh, in the realm of the science mission. So for example, if you've got scientific competition, that's something that's going to come out as the scientists talk about this. But the scientists per se aren't going to understand, for example, what a your uh, uh, cyber threat may come about if someone's coming in with, with a ransomware or there's a new set of attacks going on. So we touch on some of this, but it, this model does not completely cover, for example, today's set of, of threats around a particular threat actor because that's going to change very often. And actually, let me um, go on and talk here about the, the current slide I'm on, which is the next step in the process, which is sort of once you've gotten down to the, um, ah, here we go, sorry, I went the wrong way. So now once you have understood the consequences of important from above, now you get down to the avenues of attack that can lead to those, those consequences. And frankly, these are the things that are probably going to change most, most often as we see new trends in malware and new priorities uh, among the, the threat actors. So you know something like you know Bitcoin changed a bunch of priorities as, as suddenly computing power just unto itself became something of valuable to adversaries. And so this is where we, we get the most change. This is also where the greatest knowledge of the current InfoSec ecosystem comes into play. So the idea is when you've got to step five at this process, now what you have is the understanding the consequence that's important to the scientist, a mapping of those down to the avenues of attack that are meaningful to the IT and the InfoSec professionals, and you have a shared understanding between the two. The InfoSec under professionals understand why these avenues of attack are important to the scientists. And likewise, the scientists now have this understanding of why when the InfoSec folks are going off and putting these new mitigations into place, they can now understand how that relates back up to the science consequences. Uh, one thing just to mention, what we've discussed right now is a, a one-time process. I uh, always like to emphasize that, as with any sort of cybersecurity or programmatic endeavor, this is something that is probably best repeated on an annual basis. Uh, maintenance mode is probably a lighter weight. You're revisiting what you did last year, and you're looking at things as the assets and the projects change, have the concerns changed, the consequences from the scientist's perspective. And this is where the InfoSec folks would come in with their understanding of the changes of the InfoSec landscape. You know, how have adversarial adversarial approaches or 
uh, priorities changed from their perspective in talking to their their colleagues in the the infosec community. So this is a little bit more events where the adversarial perspectives would come in as they change over time. And mentioning about that and talking about this is is a a living document. So one of the things that we recognize is that what we have here is a good set of generic assets, consequences, and concerns. We are certain we do not cover uh, the entire scientific ecosystem. And hence, we very much intend this to be a living document. And we actually followed some, uh, some process being used by uh, NIST, the National Institute of uh, Standards and Technologies, right now. And we put it up using Markdown on GitHub. And so it's under an attribute license that allows for, for mod modifications, contributions, and whatnot. And you can use all the GitHub mechanisms that one would normally use for sort of a, making contributions to a source code repository to make contributions to this document. And for those of you who haven't used GitHub in this sort of way, they have some nice flow controls where you can go in, you can edit Markdown actually in sort of a WYSIWYG mode, or you can pull it down in a more technical and use your favorite local editor to make change it. But then you can do this process where you can very easily make suggestions to the document, and the maintainers can look at those and with just a couple clicks incorporate them into the, into the document. And we actually have a whole section in the document about how you can go about uh, making these contributions. We do plan on, on making a snapshot, a version 1.0 on February 10th, rolling up all the suggestions we have at that point. That certainly won't be the end of things. We just think it's really valuable to, to put a 1.0 out there that, that people can clearly reference at that point. And then our plan is to revisit roughly quarterly. And I admit this is sort of a guess right now. It depends on the, the, the rate of flow we get in from the community. If we get lots of contributions, we may do it more often. But, but keep this going. And our, our vision here is really a document that the community can contribute to, and we may even bring additional people on as, as moderators and whatnot as we go forward. So f in, in conclusion, to wrap up here and give us a little more time for, for questions, you know, the overall goal here is to help ensure the trustworthy nature of science. And we've chosen this particular approach here of the asset-centric approach with the hope that we will speak more to the science by starting with assets and consequences that are more meaningful to them and then providing a map from those things down to the technical and infosec risks to help bridge the communication uh, between those communities. As, as my colleagues have sort of mentioned, we realized that in the working group on this, what we were really trying to do was to bridge the language uh, between those, those two communities. And as I've mentioned, we really welcome uh, feedback and contributions on the document. And I, I believe we've set up a pretty good mechanism uh, to do so. Uh, so finally, as you've all been waiting for on the edge of your seat, uh, here is the, the URL to the document itself hosted on, on GitHub, and that takes you to the, the clean markup version that's, that's, that's readable. And you can see below our uh, uh, a link to putting issues, and you'll find a link to the document itself to the GitHub repository so you can actually get at the source. Uh, for updates in the document, as we, we do things, I encourage everyone to follow the, uh, the Trusted CI blog. And amongst other news, we will have updates of the document, or of course, we have the, uh, the CTSC uh, email list. And finally, just on behalf of the organizers, I want to thank you know, particularly Rich and Karen, who joined us here today, but the other members of the working group that, that Sean uh, has already mentioned. And then I'll just add at the very bottom of this slide, we invited a number of folks from the, the science community to come give their perspectives on risks. Uh, you know, obviously some of these folks have experiences in various projects, but they gave personal accounts, which were very interesting and helped the, uh, the group uh, form their opinions as they went on. So I also want to thank uh, Tanya, Matt, Fred, and, and Alex uh, for their presentations to the group. And then finally, a set of acknowledgments, a uh, number of agencies who, who funded the various working group members, and we just want to thank, thank all of them. And, and you know. so. With that, uh, Jeanette, I think I will uh, uh, pass it back to you. And, and Vince, welcome to see if I, I answered your question well enough. Great. Thank you. Uh, so we're open for questions. I just want to note that all the links that Vaughn posted on that one slide, two slides ago, I just copied it and posted it here. 
it's actually clickable in this format in the chat, so that's easier for you guys to grab it. Um, thank you all for participating, and we'll take questions. And while people are typing, I just want to go over a couple of issues or updates. Uh, first, to view presentations, to join the discuss mailing list, the announcements mailing list, or submit requests to present, please visit us at trustedci.org slash webinars. Our next webinar is February 27th at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. The topic is Cybersecurity Program for Small Projects, and our presenters are CTSC's very own Craig Jackson, Susan Sons, and Bob Cowles. For more information on upcoming webinars, to, to view the rest, to, to view previous webinars, just co go and visit us at the trustedci.org slash webinars. And looks like, Craig, we have our first question from Craig. Uh, if the primary audience is scientists, how are you getting it socialized to them? Uh, thanks, Craig. I'll, I'll take a, a, a stab at that. And it, it's not an easy, easy thing to do. Uh, you know, I was out at the AGU meeting last week and had an opportunity to, to mention uh, this work there. And really the, uh, the, the short answer to your question is it's just sort of beating the pavement and trying to find opportunities uh, to get out amongst the scientists. And our hope is as we get uh, a few early success stories in the community, there's sort of nothing better than hearing from the peers. So, you know, hope to, uh, to have some, uh, some, some scientists sharing it amongst themselves, which is, I think, is as effective as you can get, certainly compared to, you know, having us as IT folks try to go, you know, sell them on this great thing. Hopefully they'll hear it from each other. And I'm trying to remember, just to add to that, Vaughn, I, I think we had at least somewhere between six and eight case studies that we really, uh, we really looked at and had the scientists uh, from those particular domains presenting those case studies, and our, our hope is to continue to go back to those scientists and and uh, help work with them to evangelize this within their own communities as well. So at least we can try and start with our own case studies to to bootstrap this process. And I see Jeanette, you've mentioned a, a survey in the comments. Do you want to give folks a little context about that? Yes, thank you. I forgot to mention, we have a survey, so please uh, take an opportunity to give us some feedback, and also we are eagerly accepting suggestions for topics or presenters, and that that's included in the survey. So uh, does anybody else have any questions? Please type in the chat box. Okay, uh, well, while we're waiting, and we've just got a couple more minutes, uh, Karen or Richard, do you have any additional comments that you would like to make? Probably. <laughs> um, now, I think this is an interesting document. I've certainly been enjoyed working on this project. Um, and I know that I, you know, I live in that world where I have no dedicated cybersecurity support. I have no one whose job it is to do this. I basically have a bunch of computer programmers and scientists, bioinformaticians, and we have to kind of figure it out as we go. And so I think there is a need for this sort of project in the community. Um, and as that uh, question came up about socializing, and I was thinking, you know, what we need to do is probably start writing some letters to the editors in prominent journals just to let them know that this is out there, and I think we could get some traction that way. Because I think there are a lot of other people like me who are interested in this. And I'll shut up now. The only other thing I would add is please help us evangelize uh, and please help us with this document. Um, we, uh, I think this, this document uh, we hope will be useful to scientists in the community. It will be more useful if more of them know about it. It will be more useful if uh, people help uh, uh, correct our own uh, 
um, uh, misconceptions about the, the best ways to help uh, explain this uh, uh, vocabulary and, and dialogue between scientists and cybersecurity professionals. Um, and uh, so we would uh, uh, appreciate any inputs. I should uh, add to uh, Vaughn's uh, comment earlier about uh, submitting questions, comments, or changes via GitHub. We've actually already had quite a lot of those since uh, an initial draft was released of this uh, uh, last fall. And uh, if there's any additional ones, we, we welcome those. Uh, we certainly are grateful for the participants today from the uh, Department of Energy and the National Science Foundation. And please help uh, tell your, your any scientists that you might be funding or working with about this as well. We would uh, appreciate others adopting this, and we would appreciate feedback from them too. Okay, let's take you know one more question. Um, it looks like we've got another question from Vince. Can you share any case studies of actual exploits? They are in the documents. Vince, are, uh, Vaughn, would you like to walk yeah. through one of them in particular? Uh, I was about to say they're in the document. Let me. Uh, it'll take me a second here to bring that up. You know why I'm doing that? Let me also just. In terms of the socialization, uh, Rich's comment actually reminded me that uh, we are we're working on a couple articles for scientific computing and science science note about this. So that's another way we're we're working on disseminating it. Yeah. So Vince, if you go through and and click through to click through to the the profile, we actually have. Uh, some examples of computer security incidents uh, affecting research in Section 5 of the document. And there are uh, seven of them in there. There's some non-targeted ones where it is just uh, the science just happened to be an innocent bystander of some security. And then we have uh, some, some targeted ones where we get into, so building on some of the examples that that Karen talked up where there was a, a, a controversial project. And we've done a little bit of sanitation here, but many of you might recognize this as the three meter telescope uh, issue where hacktivists uh, generated uh, a large amount of uh, DDoS and also some, uh, some denial of service attacks and also knocking a project's website off of line with both email and web, web attacks. And then also the, uh, the climate scientist research group hacked by protesters uh, is number seven in there. Great. And yeah, it thank looks you. like Jim yeah, posted that link for us. Um, and we've got one more question coming in. Oh, great. <laughs> Thank you, Rajiv. <laughs> OK, well, uh, I, think, I think we're ready to wrap up. Uh, Vaughn, Sean, uh, Karen, uh, Richard, thank you so much for uh, coming and presenting the uh, cyber risk profile. Uh, and with that, I'll just let Vaughn give the last words. I just want to thank everybody who, who showed up today to listen to this. And uh, hopefully we'll go out and, and talk about it and or give us some feedback on this and really appreciate your, your time and attention to what I think is a, is a very important uh, matter for the scientific community. And the only thing I'll, I'll add, uh, Vaughn just reminded me, we are actually uh, also working on uh, an article that will go out in, um, is it IEEE Scientific Computing uh, uh, Magazine? Is that coming out uh, fairly soon, I think, Vaughn? And also Science Node, which uh, uh, is, uh, an, um, I believe, online science publication, is also working on uh, an article related to this as well. Um, and we will, I think, be distributing information on that soon, but you might want to keep an eye out for that, too. Oh, Richard. And, uh, uh, yeah. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Vaughn. Oh, Richard just wanted to make sure that this talk is available to the public. Yes, I post the recording of this presentation after it's uh, done. Thanks. Sure. Vaughn, did you want to say something? Uh, no, Jeanette. I think uh, my thanks. 
just thanks to everyone again, and thank you for uh, for being our MC. All right, great. Well, with that, I will close the meeting. Everybody have a great day.